Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us online and in the audience here at Ragged Theatre at Geoscience Australia today. I'm Alison Rose. I'm Chief of Space Division here at Geoscience Australia. Welcome to this week's Distinguished Geoscience Australia Lecturer Seminar. Geoscience Australia acknowledges the traditional owners and custodians of country throughout Australia and acknowledges their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to the people, the cultures and the elders, past and present. Our distinguished Geoscience Australia guest lecturer or DGAL this morning is Dr. Salim Masumi, and he will be presenting Geoscience Australia's role in the IGS Analysis Centre coordination. Geoscience Australia currently retains the Analysis Centre coordinator role for the International GNSS Service. The IGS Analysis Centre coordinator has overall responsibility for generating the main official IGS combined products. Currently, there are three IGS product lines for GNSS satellite orbits and clocks, namely the IGS Final, the IGS Rapid, and uh, the IGS um, Ultra Rapid products, each with different accuracies and latencies. The IGS is a key operational agency for supporting multi-constellation GNSS operations, enabling governments, academia and industry to provide highest quality positioning services. The coordination role is fundamental to the Positioning Australia program and specifically the Ginan Analysis Centre software to transition into an IGS endorsed globally recognised analysis centre. This talk introduces GA's role in the IGS Analysis Centre coordination and the re relevance to positioning Australia and generally Australia operating a GNSS Analysis Centre with an operational Ginan Analysis Centre software as part of the GA Strategy 2028, creating a location-enabled Australia. Now a little bit about our presenter. Dr. Salim Masumi obtained a PhD in 2017 from the Australian National University Research School of Earth Scientists with a focus on modelling the GNSS observations for improved positioning accuracies. Since then, he has been working in the field of GNSS analysis at Geoscience Australia. He has been the IGS Analysis Centre Coordinator since 2021 and is currently acting GNSS team leader of GA's GNSS analysis section. So please join me in welcoming uh, Salim to the podium. Over to you, Salim. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Alison. Thank you very much uh, for attending this talk today, either in person here at GA uh, and uh, through the um, virtual platform online. Uh, it is my pleasure today to talk about the uh, role that we uh, play in uh, at the Geoscience Australia uh, in the IGS Analysis Center coordination. So, uh, before getting any, any further, we all hate acronyms, don't we? So I'll just uh, um, provide you with a few acronyms that I might be using more than a couple of times during my presentation. Uh, I'll go through them in detail during the presentation, but I thought it would be a good idea to uh, just go into the acronyms initially uh, before going any further. So the IGS. Uh, is an organization which was established in 1994 uh, as International GPS Service. However, in 2005, it was renamed to the International GNSS Service. So GPS is the global positioning system and the GNSS is the broader term used for uh, all the uh, constellations of na uh, satellite navigation satellite systems uh, or global navigation satellite system, which uh, includes GPS, but also includes other navigation satellite systems. When we talk about the, an IGS-AC, we are usually referring to uh, an IGS analysis center. 
these are the analysis centers that, pr uh, that process the observations from the GPS and are affiliated with the IGS. Uh, when we are talking about the IGS ACC, we are talking about IGS Analysis Center Coordinator, which is the role that um, I've been uh, engaged with, with in the pa past couple of years. Uh, this role is sometimes also uh, referred to as IGS Combination Center. So this is the role that's uh, given the solutions from the IGS Analysis Centers, combines them into the official IGS products. Uh, GA obviously is Geoscience Australia, um, PPP is Precise Point Positioning, which is a uh, very popular technique these days for finding out the location of the uh, points on the Earth, which uses uh, only one receiver rather than a network of receivers. Uh, and ITRF is the International Terrestrial Reference Frame, uh, which is a reference frame suitable for use with uh, measurements on or near the Earth's surface uh, with origin at the Earth's center of mass. Uh, it is maintained by the International Earth Rotation and Reference System Service uh, and is considered as a standard reference, um, for, for reference frame for most of the geodetic techniques. Okay, so uh, I'll talk a little bit about what is GNSS. Starting with the GPS, um, Global Positioning System is a US government uh, owned uh, positioning system, which includes a, uh, about currently 32 satellites involving around uh, the Earth at altitudes of around 20,000 kilometers above the Earth's surface. It, was, uh, it first became operational in 1993 uh, and these satellites are constantly broadcasting radio navigation signals. Um, at any given location uh, at, and, and at any time on the Earth, uh, around 9 to 12 GPS satellites are visible. Um, following the success of the GPS, uh, more countries or regions started to launch uh, navigation satellite systems uh, called broadly as a global navigation satellite system or GNSS, including the European Union's Galileo, uh, Russian GLONASS, Chinese Baidu, and also regional systems such as uh, those from India and Japan. In total, all these constellations, often referred to as multi GNSS satellites, uh, come up to around 140 satellites at the moment, and they are increasingly. Uh, speeding up launching more satellites into the space for the positioning um, purpose. So at any given uh, time and at any location on the Earth, you're expecting to see around 40 to 50 GNSS satellites. So let's see how GNSS works. Um, it, its primary purpose is to find your location on the Earth. So imagine this person wants to know where they are on the Earth. Um, so the, the basic concept of uh, GNSS uh, measurements are uh, trilateration, uh, which is the measurement of distances. So if this person can uh, measure their distance from a GNSS satellite, which is uh, orbiting around the Earth, as let's say R, they can know that they are somewhere in this circle, or on this circle. So anywhere on the circle, uh, they must be. Uh, they they could be because they the only information they know is the position of the satellite and the distance from the satellite. Now, if they can measure at this the distance from a second GNSS satellite, they know they are somewhere uh, at one of the two points uh, of the intersection between the two circles. So they must be either somewhere in West Africa or somewhere close to the North Pole. Now, if they can measure the distance from a third GNSS satellite, they now for sure know that they are somewhere in the West Africa, which is the intersection of the three circles here. So this is a basic concept of the GNSS in and it's and now they are happy they know it, although because the satellites are also moving, around the Earth, so the time becomes important here. So we, they need to know when the 
signal from the satellite in, well, let me go one step back. In measuring the distance, they need to uh, have a receiver on their hand receiving the signals broadcast or transmitted from the satellites to, to their receiver. And their receiver can decode this and can realize, can measure the distance that the signal has traveled. So because the satellite is moving, um, the time becomes important, as I said. Uh, they need to exactly know when the signal was transmitted with, from the satellite and when exactly it was received at the receiver. So we need to solve for the clock as well, uh, which are often referred to as clock errors. Um, all in all, uh, at least four satellites are needed to find your location, uh, your 3D location on the Earth. Um, and solve for the clock errors as well. Um, in 3D, this, the circles will become spheres, obviously. So we've got a, and this way we can, we can measure where we are on the ground using even a handheld GNSS receiver, which is now in uh, the smartphones as well. However, we need to first know where the satellite is itself before we can find out where we are. So there are a few more calculations need, needed to be done. Uh, these calculations are often referred to as satellite orbit determination, which is basically finding out the position of the satellite in its orbit around the Earth at any given time. So the orbit determination generally follows the Newton's second law of motion, which says if we know all the sources, uh, all the forces uh, that are acting upon, the, upon an object of mass m, then we can find out the acceleration of that object, which is the rate of speed of that object, which means that we can get the position of the object at any given time. In this case, the object is a satellite. So what are these forces acting upon the satellite? Usually these forces are categorized into the forces related to the gravity, called gravitational forces, and other forces, which are usually called non-gravitational forces. The primary gravitational force is Earth's gravity. Uh, gravitational attraction of the Earth holds the, orb uh, holds the satellite uh, in its orbit around the Earth. However, the mass inside the Earth is like any other planet is not uh, constant uh, and is not homogeneous. Therefore, the gravity depends also on the satellite's location above the Earth. Um, not only Earth has the impact from the gravity on the satellite, the Sun, the Moon and other planets also try to uh, pull the satellite towards themselves. Of course, they are too far from the satellite compared to the Earth, so they can't uh, pull the satellite from its orbit. However, they cause fluctuations in the Earth's position, um, in the um, satellite's position orbiting around the Earth. Tides are another effect um, which should be considered when calculating the, Earth, the satellite's orbit. Uh, the type of tide that we are mostly familiar with is the ocean tides. Uh, where the ocean surface rises when the moon rises uh, due to the gravity from the moon. Um, and this basically uh, moves a, a vast amount of water mass from one place on the Earth to another place. And this in, in turn has an effect on the position of the satellite because of the changes in the gravity of the Earth. Um, there are not only oceans, uh, that are experiencing tides, the solid Earth also experiences tides. Uh, the atmosphere around the Earth experiences similar uh, type of tides. There are also non-tidal variations in the mass uh, which affect the gravitational attraction imposed on the satellite from the Earth, uh, such as the changes in the atmospheric pressure, the ocean currents induced by winds, the changes in the water storage uh, levels in you know, on the ground, uh, in the ground. So um, these are sorts of the gravitational forces that need to be accounted for when trying to determine the position of the uh, satellite. There are also non-gravitational forces. For instance, the radiation from the sun 
pushes uh, an acceleration onto the satellite, and uh, which is normally called, usually called a solar radiation pressure, um, and needs to be calculated. The same solar radiation, when reflected from the Earth, again pushes another acceleration on the satellite, uh, which is often called uh, as Earth's radiation pressure. Because the satellites are constantly broadcasting radio navigation signals, this uh, induces an acceleration on the opposite direction, away from the Earth on the satellite. It's a very small effect, but it still needs to be considered when you're looking for centimeter level accuracy for the orbits. The non-gravitational forces such as this depend very much on the physical properties of the satellites, such as their shape or their materials used on them. And because we normally don't have enough information, a detailed information about the physical properties of the satellites, they are often harder to model. For example, for the uh, solar radiation pressure and the, for the shape of the satellite, usually currently a uh, box wing model is uh, used, for instance which assumes that the satellite is like a box with some set dimensions and then the two solar panels are uh, its wings. So usually they try to simplify the, the, the models um, and get um, um, an approximation of the shape of the satellite. So this way now we can uh, get to the point that we know the position of the satellite, we have measured the distance, and now again we, we are happy that we can uh, have, the, have our location on the Earth. However, the signal traveling from the satellite to, the, to your receiver on the ground experiences um, errors. These errors uh, are caused by different factors. For example, the signal travels through the atmosphere and that has an impact on the distance traveled by the signal from the satellite to the receiver. And this needs to be um, factored in when we, are, when we are trying to calculate that distance. Uh, there are also clock errors. Um, basically, the clocks on the receiver and the, clocks, uh, the clock on the, on the satellite are not synced to a uh, reference uh, clock. So these are sort of errors that happen. Uh, there are also hardware bias delays, antenna patterns, for instance, where exactly uh, on the antenna from the satellite uh, the signal is broadcast from, or where exactly the antenna on your receiver is receiving the signals. This, these are the sort of errors that need to be considered for when you are writing out the equations for solving for this uh, distance or solving for your uh, 3D position. And these are the sort of um, parameters that need to be estimated during the uh, posi during your positioning processing uh, and this is the sort of thing that usually the GNSS processing software do for instance okay we know <laughs> uh, for instance the uh, non uh, GNSS processing software that is being developed at the moment uh, as part of the positioning Australia program in geoscience Australia does that sort of processing and it aims for um, providing three to five centimeter accuracy of positioning uh, to the end users. So talking about the GNON and the positioning Australia, I'll just give a brief overview of the positioning Australia as part of the Geoscience Australia Strategy 2028, creating a location enabled Australia, positioning Australia uh, has a role to lead and coordinate a whole of government positioning capability uh, that is integrated well with the positioning navigation and timing, uh, lead and strength and governance of positioning in Australia through coordination on geodesy and positioning standards, capabilities, advice and information in national and international forums. Uh, position verification is another role, uh, sustaining and improving the Australian geospatial reference system and also deliver and enable access to the precise positioning information. So one of these international forum, forum that the Positioning Australia contributes to is the International GNSS Service. The International GNSS Service, or IGS, is the world's largest GNSS organization with over 25 years of history of advocating for and providing 
freely and openly available high precision GNSS data and products. The IGS consists of over 300 associate members representing over 45 countries or regions and over 200 uh, contributing organizations. Its mission is to provide on an openly available basis the highest quality GNSS data, products and services in support of the terrestrial reference frame, Earth observational research, positioning, navigation and timing and other applications benefiting science and society. So the IGS is one of the four Space Geodesy International Services and Techniques under the umbrella of the International Association of Geodesy and the Global Geodetic Observing System. Uh, the other three being SLR, VLBI and DORIS. The IGS, as part of its strategy 2020 plus, uh, has follow, follows three main goals, achieve multi-GNSS technical excellence, strengthen outreach and engagement, and build sustainability and resilience. So how does the Geoscience Australia contribute and participate in the IGS? We have eight associate members in the IGS across all the four different sections of the Positioning Australia branch. We have five active working group members in the IGS, in the Antenna Working Group, PPP, Real Time, Reference Frame and INSVIA Working Group. We have two governing board members and GA is a regional data center for the IGS as the Asia Pacific Reference Frame data center. So one of these, those two governing board members is related to the IGS Analysis Center coordination and that's uh, what I have been involved uh, in for the past uh, couple of years. So I'll go through the IGS analysis centers and the role that the coordinator does uh, um, plays. So uh, looking at this map in here, it shows the uh, global IGS affiliated analysis centers that are around 13 and they process GNSS satellites and produce products such as satellite positions or orbits and clocks and other products. You can clearly see a bias towards the northern hemisphere. Not all of the global, uh, all of the IGS analysis centers are currently in the northern hemisphere. Um, even though we are not a still a an analysis center, we are playing the role of the analysis center coordinator or the IGS ACC, and we monitor the quality of the products and combine the products from all these analysis centers to produce official main IGS products. The IGS ACC also has overall responsibility for coordinating the changes, developments and improvements within the contributing analysis centers to produce the IGS products using the latest models and standards. As I said, currently Geoscience Australia retains its role in a shared role with the MIT in uh, the USA. So, uh, we just had a look at uh, the IGS organization and how the analysis centers work together. So we want to uh, go a little bit further than that and see what exactly goes uh, from collecting raw data in the GNSS stations uh, to uh, the end users. So we know we can measure the uh, location uh, on Earth using a GNSS receiver. There are uh, GNSS receivers that are permanently mounted on the ground, which are often referred to as GNSS reference stations, like this one, which is uh, in Mount Stromlo Observatory, uh, just outside Canberra. Um, Australia, Geoscience Australia, maintains a dense network of these uh, reference stations in Australia, but the IGS also uh, some of those GNSS reference stations are contributing to the IGS and in total globally there are more than 500 global GNSS reference stations from all sorts of different countries and regions that are contributing to the IGS network as you can see in the uh, map in here. So this network of more than 500 global GNSS stations are constantly tracking the GNSS satellites 
update data. So basically they're tracking the signals from the GNSS satellites on a constant basis. And they submit their raw data of the measurements from the signals to the IGS data centers. What happens then is the IGS analysis centers receive these data and process them using their own software and models. And they each produce a set of products or solutions for the satellite orbits, satellite clocks, troposphere, or other stuff. And they submit them back to the IGS data centers. Um, there is a reference frame coordinator in the IGS, uh, which is currently held by the uh, National Geographic Institute in France. Uh, and they are in charge of producing and combining the station position solutions from these analysis centers. And these station positions contribute to the reference frame or to the international terrestrial reference frame. So they combine them, put them back to the data centers, and then it comes uh, our role as the IGS analysis center coordinator or combination center. Uh, we combine the satellite orbits and clocks from the analysis centers, which are aligned to the reference frame provided by the reference frame coordinator and provide the official IGS orbits and clocks and submit them back to the data centers and users, a vast uh, range of users can then use the IGS products from industry to academia to uh, governments. For instance, here in uh, GA for our online positioning service, uh, which is called OSPOS. We use some of the IGS products. The Ginan development team are currently using some of the IGS product. Um, our uh, Asia Pacific reference frame or APREF uh, solutions are using some of the IGS products. Um, and the IGS products are, as I said, contributing to the reference to the international terrestrial reference frame and the um, and that is being used as the, uh, in the Australian geospatial reference frame as well. We also use them for other uh, auxiliary products uh, like the troposphere products that we are providing uh, to the uh, Bureau of Meteorology as well. So these plot series in here are an example of the time series of the positions from the Asia Pacific reference frame. Uh, produced in the GA and in these time series of the positions or in these position estimations we use the IGS products as well. So uh, the IGS analysis centers do process the GNSS data and they do produce the their own solutions of orbits. Why do we need a combination of them? Well um, Redundancy is a key factor in here, so uh, we can't rely on only one analysis center. Let's say today one analysis center goes down, mm, the internet goes down over there, so they can't produce anything. So we, we need to have redundancy so that we can uh, provide the IGS products on a continuous basis. Also, there might be gaps, there might be outliers in the IGS analysis center products, so we by combining them we want to cover those gaps and uh, remove those outliers before having a the most accurate, uh, the most possible um, accurate IGS products. Also, each of these analysis centers are using their own uh, models and standards, so they might dif the solutions might differ, even though once in a while we come together and we uh, basically agree on a set of recommended um, products, uh, recommended standards, However, uh, because of the differences in the uh, software and the models and standards, the solutions still differ from each other. So what we want to do as a combination is to provide uh, the best possible solution out of them. How do we do that? Uh, basically, it's a weighted average. Uh, however, it's a robust weighted average, meaning that it is um, um, resistant to the outliers. So it, it has a way to deal with the outliers without impacting the solution. Uh, and there are also outlier removal procedures in, uh, in place that uh, remove those outliers. And what we produce, as I said, the IGS official products, which are supposed to give access to the IGS reference frame. 
So uh, the figure on the top is an example of how much each of the analysis centers are given weight in the uh, combination. So basically, um, this is over time from 2013 to 2021. The, um, the wider um, um, colors show that that analysis center has been given more weight. Um, and the narrower ones are given less weight. The figure on the below is a historic uh, IGS final orbit products, and this is a comparison between all the uh, orbit solutions from the different analysis centers over time since 1994. So you can see that in 1994, uh, the uh, orbit solutions from different analysis centers were differing by levels of up to uh, 300 millimeters. However, they are now at the levels of about 10 millimeters. So this is the huge improvement in the modeling uh, of the GNSS satellites or GPS satellites in this case over time. So just going through uh, uh, quickly to the IGS products. Uh, so these are the products that are uh, mm, provided by the IGS as official products. Uh, satellite orbit, satellite and station clocks, the ultra rapid, rapid and final products are the ones that we are in charge of. Station positions and velocities, uh, which the reference frame coordinator is in charge of, as well as Earth rotation and atmospheric parameters. So I'll now focus on the products that we are in charge of, namely the IGS orbits and clocks in ultra, for ultra rapid, rapid and final. Um, so. GPS ultra rapid orbits, we, we provide them four times per day. With a, uh, they usually uh, have spanned 48 hours of data, the first 24 hours being the observed half with a latency of three to nine hours. The second half is basically a real time prediction for the next 24 hours. Accuracy of these orbits for the observed half are about three centimeter and for the predicted half are about five centimeters. So we are we are talking about five centimeter, three to five centimeter accuracy for the position of the satellites around the Earth. So the figures in here are showing the accuracy of the IGS ultra rapid orbit as compared to the IGS rapid orbit, which are the next um, most accurate products from the IGS. So again, since about 2001, uh, you can see the improvement in the accuracy of the ultra rapid orbits. Um, for the observed half, the uh, accuracy levels are below 10 millimeters compared to the IGS rapid. For the uh, predicted half, it's, uh, I think, mostly around 40 millimeters um, of accuracy compared to the IGS rapid. Then we have the GPS rapid orbits and clocks, which uh, we provide on a daily basis with a latency of 17 to 41 hours. The accuracy of these orbits are around 2.5 centimeter and the accuracy of the clocks are around 25 picoseconds. Just for your reference, 30 picosecond clock as a rule of thumb is equivalent to about 9 millimeter in error in the range. So the figures in here uh, are the comparison of the solutions from the different analysis centers uh, for the rapid orbits on the left and the rapid clocks on the uh, on the right. So the rapid orbits, you can see that the centers are uh, consistent at the levels of around 10 millimeters with each other. There are a few cent the, there are a few solutions that are higher than this, but keep in mind that these solutions are not being weighted in the IGS official combinations. Only for the comparisons, uh, we have brought them here. Clocks are. Uh, consistent with each other at levels of between 10 to 20 picoseconds. And then again, a few solutions are having uh, more inconsistent clocks that are not being used in the IGS official combinations. Finally, we have the GPS final orbits and clocks, which we provide on a weekly basis with a latency of 12 to 18 days. The accuracy of these orbits are around again around 2.5 centimeters and the clocks 20 picoseconds. These final orbits, the extra time we are giving the analysis centers to process for almost 
two weeks, uh, more than two weeks, basically two to three weeks, uh, allows the analysis centers to implement the highest accuracy models and standards in their solution. So these are supposed to be the uh, highest, highest quality products of the IGS. So again, you can see the final orbits, consistencies between the different analysis centers, uh, which are around the levels of 10 millimeters and the clocks being around uh, the level of 10 to 20 picoseconds. In addition to the three sets of IGS operational products, once every few years we uh, do a uh, set of reprocessing uh, campaigns. So um, the first reprocessing campaign of the IGS called Repro1 uh, occurred at around the year 2010, the second uh, in 2015, and the most recent one, Repro3, started in 2019 and was just completed recently. So in each of these reprocessing campaign, the analysis centers reprocess the whole history of GNSS data since 1994 with the latest models and standards. So starting with each campaign, usually the analysis centers come together in a few workshops and they discuss the latest models and standards uh, regarding the orbit determination, regarding the finding out the locations of the stations on the Earth, uh, and they come up with a set of recommendations for the best models and standards to use. And then each of the analysis center will go their way. They start processing the historic data. Once they have completed this task, they submit them to the reference frame coordinator and the analysis center co coordinator, just the same as with the operational products. And we pro combine the products to pro provide the reprocessed um, 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 products of the IGS. These reprocessed products cont usually contribute to the, a new version of the International Terrestrial Reference Frame. Um, also, after each reprocessing, we usually start transitioning to the latest models and standards um, that we agreed on in the past repro. So, looking at the uh, repro3, um, I would list briefly two most important uh, improvements of the repro3 compared to the previous repros. Uh, for the first time, we have used the multi-GNSS, so at least a few analysis centers uh, have processed three uh, constellations, um, GPS, Galileo, and GLONASS uh, for the repro3. And the combined products include the data for those uh, satellites as well. Also, we are in the combinations, we used an improved uh, clock combination, which improves the accuracy of the PPP solution. So I'll now show you just briefly some of the uh, results from the Repro3. Uh, this is the inconsistencies again uh, of the satellite orbit solutions from the IGS Repro3, again from 1994 to uh, 2020. So you can see the, again the huge improvement. This is similar to what we saw in the finals as well. The improvement in the uh, accuracy of the orbits produced since 1994. Um, since around 2004, we can see consistently that the uh, uh, solutions are consistently shorter at 10 uh, millimeter level. We can also have a look at the Galileo because for the first time we have produced the, we have processed the Galileo as uh, in the IGS. So uh, the figure on the top shows the orbit inconsistencies between the analysis centers for the Galileo overall uh, since 2013. So from about 2017, you can see that the uh, analysis centers uh, are differing with each other at the levels of 10 to 20 millimeters on a consistent level. The very high inconsistencies in the earlier years is mostly because only two or three analysis centers have processed the, the uh, Galileo um, data in that period. The other figure on the, uh, on, uh, the left here uh, is the same uh, satellite position errors for the Galileo satellites uh, 
uh, for a set of individual Galileo satellites just to have a sense of how these are differing between different satellites. So again, you can see the improvements. The shaded gray lines in here are uh, what uh, are usually referenced to as the eclipse seasons. Uh, these are when the Earth or Moon shadow the solar radiation, shadow between the solar, the radiation from the Sun to the satellite, therefore making it more complicated to model the impact of the solar radiation pressure on the satellite. So usually you can see that there are peaks around eclipse seasons. Um, a few validations have been performed already uh, by different bodies for the IGS Repro 3. So this is uh, validations, pre some preliminary validations that were provided to us by Simon Benville from Natural Resources Canada, who uh, was the chair of the PPP uh, with ambiguity resolution working group uh, in the IGS at the time. So what he did was um, he took a network of more than 100 stations globally. He then used the orbit, satellite orbit and clock products from each of the individual analysis centers. And for each analysis centers, he, uh, processed, the, uh, he, he processed the GNSS data for those network of stations using a PPP approach. Um, and basically he looked at the position errors from each of the, uh, using each of the analysis center's uh, products. He also used the IGS combined products, uh, which are blue in here. So you can see that the position errors in here over time, this is over about a year, over a year in 2011. So you can see that the IGS, which is the light blue one, sits in the bottom of the plots, which means that the IGS combined has resulted in the low, in the best uh, position uh, in the lowest position errors compared to all of the individual analysis centers and this is what you expect from an IGS combination you expect the IGS combination to uh, uh, to improve the solutions of all the individual analysis centers uh, and give you access to the um, IGS reference frame so these errors are calculated by comparing them to the IGS reference frame so uh, we have talked about the OIGS, we have talked about what we do as the analysis center coordinator and how, what are the sort of products that we have. We talked a little bit about multi-GNSS. Um, I was just uh, provided with a couple of figures from the GNAN development team uh, and I thought it would be interesting to look at their results, uh, some of the preliminary results and look at why we are pursuing the multi-GNSS, why the IGS is pursuing multi-GNSS. Um, so here uh, we have a plot provided by Ken Harima from uh, Geoscience Australia, from the GNAN development team. So here he has um, performed a PPP solution, which means a positioning solution. Uh, and this is a kinematic solution, so basically over time, we can see the improved position. So what he does is he starts with getting data from the GNSS satellites. Uh, initially, the position that is estimated from that data is not very, of very high accuracy, but over time, as we collect more information, uh, the position errors uh, go down. And this time where the position errors go down by a certain level of accuracy is usually uh, referred to as convergence time. So you can see that initially the errors, this is the horizontal position errors. You can see that initially the errors are at levels of about one meters, uh, but as the time goes by, uh, the position errors go down. So if you look at the GPS only solution, which is the blue line on the top, you can see after about three hours, the position errors are still above one centimeter level in this specific case. Um, so, if we now use some of the multi-genesis satellites, for example, the three constellation, uh, which is the brown line in here, you can see that the, after three hours, the position errors goes, uh, go down to below one centimeter. And if we use all the five available GNSS constellation, 
including uh, the GPS GLONASS Galileo as, and QZSS, sorry, four constellations, uh, we can even see improvements of uh, down to about five centimeter accuracies. Um, and this is a similar plot about the position error in the height. So again, we can observe the uh, similar impact on the height as well. So this is this this clearly shows how the multi GNSS will impact on the positioning precision. Um, and the, my colleagues in the GNOME development are hard, are working uh, on 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 this for the past couple of years, and they are still doing uh, on improving the results. So, in summary, we have talked about the uh, role of the IGS Analysis Center uh, in the IGS. We talked about the application cases. Um, we. Here we have put GNON uh, as one of the application cases from the IGS. What we are aiming at is with the, all the developments that are happening in the GNON is to have GNON as a, the uh, first, uh, I would say probably, uh, IGS affiliated analysis center in the uh, southern hemisphere. Uh, so it would be exciting times uh, and we are looking forward to that. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks.